Um, a few actually meaningful announcements today. Um, homework six was just posted on uh, Canvas today. Uh, it should be available to you. Uh, it involves uh, implementing SCM and deriving and implementing logistic regression. We'll be starting logistic regression today, so it won't be completely new. Uh, and there's an extra credit question, which involves a kind of an ensemble that you've not seen so far, which where you train a bunch of decision trees and then train an SVM on top of the prediction of the trees. Um, and there's some, uh, the theory part of it is where you derive the logistic regression. Uh, start soon. Uh, we have only two weeks left in the semester. So, uh, and that's all for the time for this homework. Um, of course, with the late period. The other announcement of consequence is uh, about final pro uh, project submissions. The deadline was April 25th. It has been moved up to April 23rd. Unfortunately, because apparently I'm not supposed to have a project due during the final exam period. Um, but to compensate for the fact that it's uh, the I'm moving the deadline, I'm extending the late period all the way to the end of the final exam period and taking away the late penalty. I'm not telling you what that means. <laughs> um, but the deadline is April 23rd. Um, what I would recommend though, is if you can get done with the project by the 23rd, get done with it so that it doesn't interfere with your finals. Um, there's a lot of things that come up at the end of the semester. Uh, and the sooner you can check things off from the list, the better it is. Uh, I think, on Kaggle, you may not be able to make submissions past the 25th or something like that, uh, because that's how I set it up uh, when the when the Kaggle project was created. And uh, I believe that Kaggle doesn't let you change that once it's set up. So that's the one thing that cannot be changed. But you can submit your report late uh, with no penalty. Did you have a question? Um, any questions, Bot? Yes. I do not see the final report question, but I have said, I saw a question on the other. We don't, we don't, we don't allow to allow the data set. No, you don't need to uh, submit the data set. But uh, I will make our program more complex and we need to need to process and generate the data set long time. I'm assuming that you're going to generate the data set using code. So submit the code that generates the data set and tell us how to generate. I hope that you're not doing any feature pre-processing by hand. No, okay. okay, yeah, because that, that would be scary. Um, uh, so the, sub, the question is, uh, the, the submissions on Kaggle are due on the 23rd and the report till the 30th. Actually, everything is due officially on the 23rd. Uh, the submissions on Kaggle, the report, and everything. And everything can be submitted till the 30th. I will see if I can change the Kaggle deadline to the 30th also. Uh, but uh, the due date is officially the 23rd. Uh, does, that, uh, does that answer your question, Christian? Okay. Uh, the other, the, since I, yes? Yes. So you need to submit, uh, it'll be like a homework submission. You submit a report and some code. In fact, uh, um, uh, the, uh, in fact, you for your homeworks, you submit everything on grade scope. For this one, it, uh, I think Canvas is good enough. Yes. So that was related to the question. So submit the code that processes your data and tell us how to run it. Rather than because there may be some limits on how much you can upload, so it's it's safer to just upload code. Yes. Uh, if we have extra code for testing purposes, should we also include that? Up to you. It's your call. I I mean, basically, we need to be able to run your project, your uh, um, submissions. Sorry, we need to be able to reconstruct your submissions to Canvas, the six official submissions that you mark out. So uh, I mentioned that there are a lot of things that are coming your way in the semester. Uh, there are many things from this class that are coming your way. There's a homework that's due on the 23rd. There's a final project submission, which is also due on the 23rd. 
and then there's the final exam which is due which is uh, two days after that on the 25th uh, at 10 30 a.m it's a two hour exam and it will look a bit like your midterm and uh, it covers everything from and including learning theory so a little bit of what was already done for the midterm meaning the early part of learning theory will still be relevant here plus everything we did in the second half of the semester um, this is going to be the same sort of uh, same style as your midterm, meaning uh, it's not open book, it's not open notes, it's closed book, closed notes, um, like such things. Um, the reason I'm putting this up here is because a lot of things are coming your way and they're all happening in that week. Um, so I would recommend you can, you know, plan your time so that the things that you can check off the list early, get them done in particular the homework and the project submission, try to get them done sooner rather than later because uh, I guarantee that week's going to be busy, not just with this class, but also probably other classes, I'm assuming. So try not to uh, let it uh, all pile up. Yeah. Yep. Yes, you can. Any other questions? I understand that uh, this time of the semester tends to be stressful and uh, looking at this I can see why mm -hmm. um, but also uh, you know try to plan ahead is all I can say is it just me or is this place darker than usual okay all right so let's uh um, let's get back to the actual content of the class. We were talking about Bayesian learning. And uh, in the last lecture, we looked at uh, Bayesian, what it means to um, learn in a from a Bayesian perspective. And the key idea here is we try to assign a probability to the events of interest. In particular, the event of interest here is what is the probability that this particular hypothesis is the true one. And this event is not independent. It's dependent on the training data that we provided. So we are looking at a conditional distribution. What's the conditional probability of the hypothesis given a data set? This quantity is also called the posterior distribution. Uh, the posterior distribution of the hypothesis conditioned on observing a data set. And uh, the, 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 the criterion for picking a classifier or a model um, that's perhaps more, the most common version of the Bayesian thing is the maximum a posteriori uh, criterion or the maximum likelihood criterion. Both of these are actually common and they are kind of, they are minor variants of each other. Uh, maximum a posteriori learning simply says we try to find the hypothesis that maximizes the posterior distribution. And the key tool that we will use here is the Bayes rule. The Bayes rule simply says the, pro the posterior distribution is proportional to the prior times the likelihood. And if we can write down both these terms as functions of, for example, the model parameters, then we can uh, we can then we can set up the problem of learning as maximizing that probability. And we'll look at an example of that uh, in more detail today, and then we'll come back to another example with logistic regression. So that's maximum a posteriori uh, estimation. The first term here, P of H, while this is called the posterior, the first term, P of H, is the prior distribution. Notice that P of the, the posterior and the prior are both statements about the hypothesis. They're both this probability distributions whose support is the hypothesis frame. Every hypothesis gets a probability according to these two distributions. The posterior distribution is the conditional distribution after having observed some data. The prior distribution is the distribution of, of the hypothesis over the hypothesis phase before any data came along. So it allows us to specify preferences about or uh, uh, preferences about the hypothesis phase. Maybe we have a reason to believe certain hypotheses are more likely to happen in nature than some other unconditionally. And we can specify those uh, uh, preferences using the prior. The posterior and the prior are proportional to each other. 
and the, 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 the ratio of their proportional um, by this term called the likelihood. The likelihood term is simply asking if a certain edge were the hypothesis, what's the probability that this particular data set among all possible data sets, this particular data set would exist in nature? And uh, the, the likelihood term can be computed. Uh, usually, a data set consists of many examples. So, the likelihood tends to be a product over each example. Now, the interesting thing here is I said the prior distribution allows us to specify preferences over the hypothesis space uh, in an unconditional fashion. Sometimes we have no preferences. We have no idea why one hypothesis might be better than the other before we see any data. In such a situation, the prior can be treated as a uniform distribution. The uniform distribution imposes no preference. If the prior were the uniform distribution, this whole expression becomes irrelevant because it's just a constant. That means the, uh, the maximum a posteriori criterion simply involves the likelihood term. In other words, we just use the likelihood term and find the, uh, find the model that maximizes the likelihood. This process is called the maximum likelihood estimation. This criterion is called the maximum likelihood estimation. Um, in the last lecture, we looked at a sort of a toy example involving Bernoulli tiles and light bulbs that instantiated maximum likelihood estimation. Today, I'm going to start with the normal uh, another example involving the normal distribution. We went through this a little bit in the last lecture. We're going to pick up from there. And then after that, we'll uh, switch over to logistic regression, where I'll introduce a new hypothesis space and apply both these criteria for the logistic regression classifier. Okay, that's the plan for uh, today and a little bit of Thursday. Any questions about uh, any of this stuff? We did not finish this. We are going to talk about the normal distribution. I say normal distribution. There's actually a, it's it's a little it's really about regression. Um, this this thing involves. This thing is really about um, um, a regression problem. Okay, I see two heads nodding, so that means all of you are on board. Um, yeah, given the data, that's all I can assume. So let's uh, let's just quickly look at revisit maximum likelihood estimation because we're going to apply this for regression. Maximum likelihood estimation. I'm I'm calling that uh, ML, or sometimes it's called MLE. HML is the hypothesis that maximizes the likelihood term. If we need to instantiate this to a new task, of course, we need to pick a hypothesis space. For any learning problem, we need to choose a hypothesis space. And then we also need to have a model that says, how could the data have been generated had little h been a hypothesis? That will allow us to concretely specify what that expression is. And we'll look at this example in a little bit of detail now. Um, we've already seen this, so you might actually see some highlighting here. Um, so the specific hypothesis space that we are looking at involves functions that map vectors in d dimensions to real numbers. So we are dealing with a regression problem. The input is x, which is a d-dimensional vector, and the output is y, which is a real number. And we are starting off with uh, what I'm going to call the, the story of the data. Suppose the generative story of the data is something like this. Every example is drawn randomly from uh, the instant space, randomly at uniform or uniformly. Um, and there is a hidden function f that uh, that's the oracle. This is the usual game that we play. So there's a hidden oracle that can label that data point, and so we get f of x, f of xi here. Unfortunately, when we are collecting the data, we don't get access to f of xi directly. Instead, nature comes in and ruins the data for us. It slightly perturbs it. It adds some noise. That noise I'm going to call ei. This noise is drawn. Is a ei is a real number. It's a real number that's drawn uniformly. It's drawn. 
uh, randomly from some unknown Gaussian distribution. So while f of xi is the true label, what we actually observe as yi is f of xi plus the error term or the noise term plus ei. So our data set consists of many pairs of the form xi and yi. Well, yi is generated by this process. I'm just assuming that the data is created this way. Now you could argue, how do you know that the data is created this way? I mean, this is just an assumption. And uh, you see why this assumption makes sense. It turns out that it actually is a reasonable thing to assume. Um, and it turns out we've actually already made this assumption before. It just didn't explicitly say. Now, consider a certain hypothesis little edge. Suppose we are entertaining the possibility that while the true function is f, h is the hypothesis that our learner is going to pick. So it's possible that maybe h is the true function. If h were the true function, we would still not see, uh, we would never see f of x equals h of x for any example because there's that noise term. So we could ask how much error, is, how much difference is going to be there. And the error on any example, y i, x i y i is y i minus h of x i. If it turned out that h was the true uh, function, if h was actually the real function f, then this quantity that I've just underlined here, this quantity is exactly the noise, right? If it was really the noise, then that quantity is coming from a Gaussian distribution because that's the assumption that we've made. That's how we believe that, that, uh, that nature generates the data. So we could um, try to see if those expressions, yi minus h of xi, beta Gaussian. We can try that. So let's try that. In particular, let's say that that error term comes from a Gaussian with a fixed standard distribution. Let's give it a name. Let's call it sigma. It's uh, it, it turns out it's going to it's going to show up eventually. It, it may show up eventually. In this case, we'll see. Uh, it's not. Uh, let's say that the error, the, the noise comes from a Gaussian with a fixed standard distribution sigma. Then the probability of observing a single data point, we can compute the normal uh, distribution density function because it comes from a Gaussian. Now we can ask what's the probability of if this was the probability of observing one labeled point, we are given a labeled data set xi comma yi uh, consisting of many uh, such instances. What's the probability of observing many data points? Our example is uh, each example is uh, drawn uh, is independent of all the others. It's iid. Mm -hmm. So probability of data given that the hypothesis is the true one is simply the product of the probability of xi comma yi given the hypothesis. Each example is independent of each other. Uh, or each example is independent of all the other examples. So you can just take the probability. Just to remind you, this data is simply the set x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on. But let's, uh, let's examine this thing a bit. This is nothing but probability of yi given xi comma h times probability of xi given h. So okay, does that make sense before we move on? Oh, yes. This is the last term. P of a comma b is nothing but p of b times p of a given b. No. Yeah. We have more than one yeah, sure. That we can condition the conditioning just always remains. Mm -hmm. So P of A given the A and B given C is nothing but let me write this again. Mm -hmm. P of B given C times P of A given the conditioning just always remains. So I can do that. But look at the last expression here, p of x i given h. I see that I've written the 
thing that I wanted to point out at the very corner, but that's probability of its size given the hypothesis. Remember how I said the data is generated. First, an example is drawn, and then the true function is applied. The choice of whether an example is drawn or not does not depend on h. That means this expression is nothing but p of xi. Our goal is to maximize over h, which means our goal here, I'm playing fast and loose with equalities, is to maximize over h this quantity here. But the second term is independent of x of uh, of h, so we don't really care that that's not going to make any difference in the maximization. Mm. So we can ignore that. Let's. Uh, Type set this more nicely. The probability of the data set given the hypothesis is simply the probability of the product of probability of every example, every labeled example, which is simply proportional to the product of the label given the example and the hypothesis. But this is exactly the term that we have here. So I can plug everything in. And let's start playing with that. This is where we left off at the end of the last lecture, and I'm going to pick up from here. So our goal is to find the hypothesis that maximizes this expression. Let's uh, work this through. Very quickly, this slide is going to get full of symbols, uh, so keep up. The first thing that we do is replace that with what we just defined. So the, the maximum likelihood hypothesis is simply the hypothesis that maximizes this quantity here. How do we maximize this expression? Any any thoughts? Yes. You take log. This is not just about maximum likelihood estimation. It's a general optimization trend. If you are Try to maximize or minimize a large product. Try to make it a sum because our algorithms work nicer. So taking log works because log is an increasing function. So the thing that maximizes the product is also the same thing that maximizes the sum of the logs. So I can take log and log taking log will simplify this quite drastically. But not immediately, but let's see what happens. We have log of the first expression here, time pl plus the log of this expression, but log of e power something is simply whatever is in the power. So we are left with this quantity. And just as a reminder, we have a bracket like this. The whole thing is inside the summation. Yes. So log is an increasing function, right? Yeah. That part. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when you are maximizing a function, imagine that you take you let let me just uh, give an example. Suppose suppose our goal is to maximize um, over all possible x's some f of x. Now, instead of maximizing over f of x, let, let I. I could apply some transformation to x, right? So let's say x star is the thing that maximizes f of x. <laughs> now consider a transformation. I'm going to apply alternatively maximize over x uh, some t of f of x. t is some transformation. Consider what happens with different types of t. Suppose t were not an increasing function. Suppose t was the sinusoid, was sine x. That's the result of this is not going to be x star, right? Suppose t were a function that so if this was not, if this was sine, as an example, as like a uh, concrete terrible example. On the other hand, let log is a maximum is an increasing function, which means if you have a if you have a curve that looks like this, applying log is not going to change the location of the maximum. It's going to just change the shape of this thing. Uh, I, I'm not good at drawing this, but 
it could have changed the shape of this. I am really not uh, good at drawing the log of a function, yeah. but it, it, it will not it will not change the location of where the maximum occurs. And that's not true just for log, that's true for any function that increases. Yes. Just increasing the frequency. Uh, technically, it's strictly increasing. Yes. Because just increasing could actually make two things. Uh, uh, it, 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 just increasing will not work, will not necessarily work. Yes. If the curve gets with the log, it gets a little lower and it looks a little flatter, but the bump remains in the same place. Okay, so we can take the log and that leaves us with this expression. Now let's stare at this a little bit. It's really the sum of two things, this quantity and the negative that. So it's, it's, odd, it's a difference, but it's the sum. Um, the first element there, log one over sigma root two pi, does not depend on h. It's a constant. Changing h is not going to change that, so we can get rid of that. So we can clean it up and uh, move things around. So we are left with this expression here. I also move the minus outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are maximizing minus sum over y minus h of xi squared divided by two sigma squared. Mm -hmm. The sigma is a constant, yes. So we can get rid of that. Sigma is just a constant scaling thing. The thing that maximizes the numerator alone will also maximize the ratio. Mm -hmm. So we can get rid of that also. But this and this is where I notice that our choice of the sigma does not matter. The only thing that matters is that it's a constant thing. Mm -hmm. So sigma goes away. And the other thing to note here is we are maximizing a negative function, mm -hmm. which is the same as minimizing the function. Mm -hmm. So putting those two together, we get uh, R min the sum over yi minus h of xi square. Mm -hmm. So the most likely hypothesis is the one that minimizes the sum of yi minus h of xi square. In particular, I did not make any assumptions about what the hypothesis phase is. I just said it's some h. Let's consider a particular a specific hypothesis phase. Suppose h was a linear function. In, that means that H is W transpose X. So this whole thing becomes R min sum over YI minus W transpose XI square. Where have we seen this before? This is linear regression. This is in particular the least mean square regression. This is exactly the same objective function for least mean square regression, except this is the probabilistic origin story for least, least mean square regression. It is the probabilistic explanation for LMF, which is kind of cool. Uh, you know, you can get to the exact same thing with two very different starting points. That suggests there's something fundamentally interesting about this objective. Questions about this, about any of these ob observations? Yes. General. Yeah. The most likely hypothesis is the one that minimizes the error. I would not say in general. In this case, for um, linear for regression, the most likely hypothesis is the one that gen that uh, everything that you said, provided we assume that the error comes from a Gaussian distribution. That's where we got. Remember, how did we get this? Square here. Let's uh, trace back the square here comes from here, which comes from here, which comes from here, which is the definition of the Gaussian. So, if we assume that the noise term in the, the in the data comes from a Gaussian distribution, then we have least mean square regression. You could have made some other assumption. For instance, if you had assume assume that that particular noise comes from a Cauchy distribution, then you will not get a square term, you will get just an absolute value. There are other distributions you can think of, and that will change, that will give us a different uh, error term. So 
Now there are two ways to think about it. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute. Did you have a question? I'm going to be interested in the reason we went through this page definition of trying to get that for us because minimizing the desire tends to be really easy. That and also it's a natural assumption to make that errors are Gaussian because Gaussian show up everywhere. You know, I'm not getting into that discussion, but it's a reasonable assumption that errors are Gaussian because, uh, for example, the central limit theorem and all that. So Gaussians are in the absence of any other information about real numbers, uh, if, uh, about uh, about real numbers that are occurring at random, just assume they're Gaussian because uh, they're centered at zero. And there are many good properties that we, we are not going to get into right now. But the interesting part here is we arrived at the exact same thing in two different ways, which means we can now think of two different lenses to see the same object. The object here is this uh, objective that we want to minimize. From the loss minimization perspective, the story says we care about minimizing the difference between the square, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, 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 the sentence doesn't make sense. We care about minimizing the square error. That error is the difference between the prediction and the ground truth. And why do we care about that? Because if we make, if we are able to perfectly reduce that quantity, then we will recover the ground truth. We are basically defining an error or a loss and saying this is the quantity that matters because this is what will be tested against. Let me directly optimize that. That gives us an optimization problem, and we get this. From the Bayesian perspective. We start off with this belief that errors are coming from a normal distribution from with zero mean and a fixed standard deviation or fixed variance. Applying the maximum likelihood principle to, start, uh, to that particular generative story gives you the exact same uh, optimization objective. Either way, we can uh, extend it in different ways. You could change your definition of error. Rather than minimizing the squared loss, you could say, Maybe my error is defined in a certain, some other way. Maybe some examples matter more. That changes the loss function. You can assign a different cost for each example. Alternatively, you could say that your examples come from a certain distribution that's not, the errors come from a certain distribution that's not normal. And uh, that changes the, that will be working through the same procedure with maximum likelihood estimation will give you a different objective to optimize. On the Bayesian side, you don't have to go with maximum likelihood estimation. You could have introduced a prior. The prior might have said that certain weights in the weight vector are more preferable. A natural prior might say, in the absence of any information, make the weight vector zero. That could be seen as, an, uh, we'll, talk, we'll see an example of that in a bit. And that is going to change this objective. It need to add an extra term that imposes a preference among models that is independent of any data. On the loss minimization side, the way to introduce a preference among models that is independent of any data is the regularizer. The regularizer can say, I don't really care what the data does. Here is a property that you should minimize for reasons that uh, have nothing to do with the Bayesian perspective. Both of these are just two different ways to uh, examine the same object. Both of these provide different natural extensions. And uh, I think you should be comfortable with both these perspectives, simply because sometimes certain extensions are more easy to motivate using one perspective than the other. Did you have a question, a follow-up? OK. Other, anyone, any questions? Quickly wrapping up this uh, section, we looked at Bayesian learning. It's just another way of asking, what is the best hypothesis? And we looked at two specific answers to this. Uh, one of them is the maximum a posteriori criterion. The other one is the maximum likelihood criterion. And we saw a couple of examples of maximum likelihood estimation. Um, 
uh, one involving a rather simple case where um, we have some uh, a, a, a Bernoulli trial, a collection of Bernoulli trials. Um, the other one involving a normal distribution for regression. And in both cases, we applied the map, uh, the maximum likelihood principle. You should be able to apply these principles for simple uh, uh, hypotheses classes. We'll be looking at one more example uh, in a bit. Any questions? Um, apply a max uh, and max What that means is uh, given a new hypothesis, there it's, it's essentially the same process again and again. You write down the distribution, you talk about you write down the likelihood term, and then you take the log of the likelihood term, you clean it up, and then you get an objective that you maximize or you minimize if you uh, if there's a negative. So, so when we do the uh, to the only when in the case where map and Emily are equal only when the prior is uniform. We assume that the in, in this uh, example that we saw here in the linear regression, we assume that all weight vectors are equally likely because we have no preference between them. And that's why we this is Emily. We never say map is equal to Emily, you just say it has a because it, uh, it has a name. Why do you want to make it more complicated? When we say maximum of posteriori, the default assumption is there is a prior. That is a non trivial for them. Yeah. It's just a specific probability distribution. That particular probability distribution, the likelihood is the distribution of the data given the hypothesis. 